Yesterday, I was talking about our role, the importance of us believers, ambassadors of Jesus Christ, doing our responsibility. You remember what I emphasized about our ambassadorial role. We are ambassadors of the Lord. We represent heaven here because in the beginning, God said, let us create man in our image. After our likeness, let him rule on our behalf on earth. So God wanted to extend his rule from heaven to the planet earth, and we are his ambassadors. Psalms 115, verse 16, says the heavens and the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth, he has given it to man. The earth, he has given it to man. The earth, he has given it to us. We are the ones responsible for whatever goes on here. He's not. He will always come on our behalf to work, but only when and only until when we have called him. When we don't call him, he will not come. He will not interfere because he has placed the full responsibility of the earth in our hands. So he has scattered us all over the world, all over the earth, so that each one of us takes authority and responsibility in our respective areas. Now I want to mention the fact that in your ambassadorial role, your embassage uh, starts from the, your personal life, then through your family, then your local church, and then on to the next level of authority. And I've put it here uh, easily so that you can see it. Each one of us, as we saw yesterday, has to have an altar. Are there people who are not here yesterday? Uh, do we have some who are not here yesterday? Okay, let me just uh, show that what, what we did yesterday very briefly so that we connect it. Yesterday we were looking at the fact that you, uh, each one of us, is one, you're a king, two, you're a priest. But your uh, this one, okay. So we're looking at this. We are priests and we are kings. But your kingship, the strength, the power, and authority of your kingship flows from your altar. When your altar is strong, your influence and authority is strong. When your altar is weak, your throne is weak. Your throne, the power of your throne is determined by the strength of your altar. So we are kings and priests. Each affects the other, but especially the altar. Your altar affects your throne. So we covered that yesterday, and I'm building on that. So on one side, you are standing before the Lord as a priest, and on the other hand, you are sitting on a throne, ruling on his behalf in the respective area that he has called you. Whether you're a businessman, a doctor, a lawyer, any field, that's where you are king. You are ruling there on his behalf in the various spheres of influence. That's where you are king. When you stand before the Lord, you access God, you access his mind, you access his interests, interests of heaven. As an ambassador, you must have a hotline from your sending authority. That's why he gives us the altar. That is the direct line. Uh, here it is the office of uh, what? Secretary of State. The ambassadors report to the Secretary of State. The ambassadors you send to different nations. Uh, in our country, we call it the fo Office of the Foreign Affairs. So all the ambassadors of Uganda report to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. That's where they get their instructions and the President. Your ambassadors from the United States, I think, report to the Secretary of State, so they represent America and America's interest anywhere they go. So they must be in tune. They must know what America stands for in order for them to do their assignment well. Otherwise, they will be representing themselves. Otherwise, they will not be representing America's interest. The reason God gave us this altar is that we can get a direct line to our sending authority. You can only access God on your altar. The altar is the means by which you and I access God's mind, 
so that we are constantly in tune with him. We get to know his mind. We get to know his interest. What are you saying about Colorado Springs, Lord? What is it that is at stake? So that altar helps us to be in constant touch. That is the direct line we have with our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So your, your, your success in doing that depends so much on this part. So that then you can adjudicate, conquer territory, extend the territory as a king, wherever you are. It depends on how well you are connected to the sending authority. Our commanding officer, our commander is the Lord himself. So we must constantly access his mind if we are to succeed in our role as kings. So our embassy is dependent on our altar. So that yesterday I made a point for those who are not with us. Then number two, I said, therefore, your altar empowers your throne. Every throne is empowered by altar. The stronger the altars, the stronger the throne, the stronger the influence. So the influence of a throne depends on its altars. For us in Africa, this is so real because we have kings. In the tribe where I come from, it's called Buganda, where we got the name Uganda. We have a king. This king is so, so influential. There are 52 clans. Each has a clan leader, and these clan leaders report to the king. But every time children are born in each of, of these clans, they are initiated in that particular clan. And those clans have altars which are connected to the main altar of the king. That's how these kings have so much authority. When they are passing, people prostrate before them. They respect him so much. They have so much influence. Because, for example, that particular king, there are 52 altars that support his throne. And all the children that are born, the moment they are initiated, they are connected to the altar. And the, the altar is connected to the throne. So for us, it's so here, I have to go through much explanation to get that. For us, that it is so easy. Because everybody sees it so clearly. I told you in Africa, the devil comes naked and he says, I'm the devil. He doesn't even hide. Here he comes in a suit and a tie. And, he, you know, <laughs> so you can't even tell he's the devil. You can even eat with him on, you know, uh, lunch in the restaurant. But he's the full devil himself. Three, one, one. So, <laughs> so these, these altars... For us, we, we know it there. People may not explain it that way, but they, that's how it is structured. Every tribe is structured like that. When children are born, they're initiated. The initiation is intended to connect every Muganda, every child in that tribe to the altar because they are given a name. When you are given a name, that name in the spirit is written on that altar. So you are named at the altar you are recorded at the altar. So when you are recorded at that altar, every time they offer sacrifices on that altar, the power from that altar affects all the children that are named on that altar. So children are named when they are initiated. When they are initiated, they are given specific names. Those names, spiritually, they are recorded at the what? The altar. And then every time they offer sacrifices on those altars, all the children, wherever they are, because they are connected in the altar, the spirit realm does not know distance. There's no distance in the spirit realm. So as long as they're named there, as soon as they do all these sacrifices, they affect all the children, wherever they are. I don't know whether it makes sense, but uh, <clears throat> that's what Israel was. Uh, let me see if I can show it to you from the biblical side. Then you may, you'll understand it better. In, the, in Israel, there were 12 tribes. Each tribe had an altar. They were all connected to the priesthood. So the, priest, the high priest 
had the 12 stones here. So you see, the high priest would present every tribe before God. Do you see the connection? So it is because the high, high priest always had these 12 stones so that every time he went before the Ark of the Covenant, he's bringing all the 12 tribes. And the day he appears on the day of atonement, he's presenting all the 12 tribes. He's one, but he, the power he comes out, out with is going to affect the whole nation for the next one year. So you can see the, you see the correlation. All truth is parallel. The devil doesn't create anything. He just copies. He's a good Xerox machine. So he copies everything that God does. And so for what you see us, what I've been explaining, is exactly what is in Leviticus and, the, and Exodus. So the high priest brings the whole nation before God. And when he offers sacrifice, sprinkles the blood at the holy place, the hall of holies, the whole nation is forgiven. The whole nation is blessed. So for the, the, the tribes are connected to the altar through the priesthood. Now, that's what in Africa we do in these, you know, but they don't explain it that way. You can only understand it when you read the Bible and you see that is exactly the connection. Now, so when I say that every, every child is connected to the altar, that's what it is. Uh, let me show you something else here. Uh, I'll get this if I, I think I have uh, something here that can make it a little bit clearer because then it will explain what I, we are going to be dealing with here in when our responsibility as, as the church. Uh, I don't have it here, I think at hand, but I'll come back to it maybe some other time. Okay, I'll leave it for now. So when, when you as a believer Create, uh, let me go back to the where I was. I'll come back to that one later. As a believer, when you established, when you have a strong altar, that altar empowers your throne. Just as I've said, our kings have so much influence because their altars are active. All the Baganda, the people of my tribe, are required to constantly connect with the what? The altar by what they do, by the sacrifices, all the non-believers. This is normal for them to do all these sorts of things. And so the king has so much authority over them. They don't know where it is coming from. It is coming from the altars. So every throne that has active altars is very powerful. It's very influential. Now I'm going to turn that over to our side now so that we can see that it's the same principle for you and me who are born again, what? Christians. When we are dealing with the kingdom of Satan and his infiltration in our nation, if we don't understand this principle, you, you kind of skip on the top yeah. while he himself is taking ground. Praise the Lord. So we find that some, many times we are we are not dealing with the roots. And so you wonder why he's g gaining ground and we are losing what? Ground. So, so that's why I'm going into this depth of, of, of explanation. So that you may know that we deal with the roots. We deal with the roots. What the power God has given us is such that in one prayer meeting, you can destroy what Satan has built for 600 years. That's the power he has given us. But we don't use it. And we sometimes because of lack of knowledge. And so, but when we understand it, and that's exactly what we are doing in Uganda, going into the foundations and the root, bringing out from the roots some of these things that have been there for centuries. Praise the Lord. We don't have to take centuries to break them. The power God has given us is such that we can break what he has done for 600 years in one meeting and we destroy his, his work and his, his kingdom. Praise, Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful that we have such power and he has given it to us? So Jesus meant that when he said, I will build my ecclesia, my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers that resist 
they will not prevail against my church when it is advancing. The church, as it is ad- it advances, the forces of darkness, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We have the power to uproot, to destroy, to root out, to pull down, to throw down, and to destroy. Praise the Lord. Remember how God told Jeremiah, I've given you power to root out, to pull down, to throw down, and to destroy. So we have that power. Okay, now um, uh, let, let me go back to now what I had started on with the altars. Why you as an individual now, I'm, I will be connecting you, the individual, to the embassy. The individual, how you build from the personal level, and then you keep building how you, 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 you build your, 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 your power, your, your source, the source of your power is your altar. Hallelujah. And I'm simplifying it so that everybody can feel I can be part of this. It does not require you to be uh, 50 years in salvation to uproot these forces of darkness. You don't need to. You don't need to first be an apostle, a great evangelist. This owner has all his saints. Praise the Lord. Psalms 149 says so. This owner has all his saints. Do you remember that passage of scripture? You don't? Let me read it to give you some faith because I see some unbelief. (laughs) (laughs) Psalms 149. Psalms 149 uh, verse 5 and 6. Let's start here. Psalms uh, 149 verse 5. Hmm. Can we read together? Are you able to? Do you read? Okay. 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 May the praise of God be in there. And the two. In there. Uh Uh-huh. To inflict on the nations. And punishment on the people. And bind their kings with fetters of uh Shut up. Uh huh. Uh huh. Praise the Lord. Eh? The King James says, This honor has all his saints. I like how it says in the King James, it says, This honor has all his saints. Eh? To execute the vengeance that is written, This honor has all his saints. And then he couldn't help saying, praise the Lord. Eh? How many have this honor? All his saints. Kindly tell your neighbor, you are included in that all. Uh (laughs) You are included, each one of us. This honor have all his saints. You notice it says that, you know, when we start to praise, we have a double-edged sword. The power is in our tongue. Yes. He has put the power in our tongue. To execute vengeance, that is already written. When Satan was defeated on the cross, the judgment was written. Jesus said, go and execute it. Go, go. you are the court beliefs. You are to apply. You are to execute my, you know, my victory. And says we have a double-edged sword, in our hands to do what? To execute vengeance. These nations and what is this referring to Satan's kingdom and his cohorts and his fallen angels to bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment. This honor was all his saints. So that is the purpose of my sharing today that each one of us, you inclusive, me inclusive, you have a part in this. You did it on your local level. He, did, he does it on his, everyone does the part and then all of us are able to bring about the victory that God wants us to have. Amen? So you do your part. Now let me go back to the first slide I had started with where I showed you the altars. Did you take those different altars, the, the uh, various altars that we have to use, that we have to, oh, why do I keep losing my slides? There are so many, you know. 
I have so many. In one uh, file alone, I have 176 slides, so you have to, eh? so you have to, to, to bear with me, so that I, and yet I have to put it in PowerPoint, because Jesus used PowerPoints in the form of parables. <laughs> so this is the, the, the part I wanted, so I, I put it in a simple table sheet. So you have to have a personal altar, because you have a personal calling. That one is yours on the individual level. You as a person, as an individual, you need to have a direct line. Now, this is not to do with your husband or your wife. This is you. This is talking about you. You as an individual, God created you unique. You are uniquely unique, different from anybody else. So you must have your personal altar, which constantly connects you. If each one of us is connected, when we come together, then we we are fire power, we are boom. Huh? So, but each one of us has to maintain that prayer altar. You, you learn to uh, repent, to ask God's forgiveness because the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. You see, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Now, why am I quoting that? Because your spirit is the altar of God where you offer sacrifices. And the first sacrifice you offer is sacrifice of repentance. The sacrifices of God are a broken what? Spirit. A contrite and broken spirit God will not despise. So you are a moving altar on which sacrifices are offered to God. And so when you maintain an active altar with God, your altar is strengthened on an individual basis. You remember, First Peter says, we are living stones. We are now the living stones being built into the habitation of God to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. We are the temple of God. We together form the temple, but each one of us is also what? The temple. Jesus told the woman at the well, the temple is moving from a place into the hearts of men. From now on, we will not worship at this well, we will not be worshiping in Jerusalem. Worship is changing from physical places to the hearts of men. The time is coming here now is when the true worshipers will now worship God in spirit and in truth. So meaning now God is moving the altar from the well at Saika and Samaria, from Jerusalem, in the temple, the altar is now moving to the hearts of what? Of men. That's where sacrifices are now going to be offered. So you are the altar of God. You are the temple. Inside that temple there is the altar. Can you turn to the neighbor and look at him and say, you are the temple of the living God? Inside you is the altar of God. Okay, uh -huh. so now, that's why people don't have to do pilgrimage to Jerusalem before they can what? Worship God. <laughs> In Israel, every man had to do that three times every year to present himself before the temple because there was only one altar. There was only one ark of the covenant. That's where God dwelt. So every man had to go at least three times. Now the altar of God moved. Now it is in your heart. When you offer true worship, then God's presence comes down in the same way as he used to come down in the temple in Jerusalem. So which now means the personal altar becomes very important to God. He deals with you as an individual. He wants to empower you as an individual. He wants to reveal himself to you as an individual. The altar is the place where he reveals himself. Abraham would have to build an altar before he could hear from God, before he could empower and enforce the, the covenant. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they always had to build an altar before they could worship. For us, the altar is there 24-7. It's new, you can worship God anytime and so you can connect with God. It's that the altar that he would reveal himself. The Bible says Abraham built an altar there and God revealed himself there. Jacob had to make and build an altar for him to be able to speak to God, 
to offer to God, they always had to do it at the altar. Thank God we don't need to do that because now our spirits, our hearts are the very altars of God. You can do that every day, every night. I'm emphasizing the personal altar to emphasize the fact that your assignment, your calling is connected to that. The degree of your seriousness on that altar is the degree to which you allow the calling of God. Your embassy to work. Your embassy is connected to the altar. You cannot be an effective ambassador if your altar is not active. The activity of your altar determines how serious an ambassador you are. Because it is on that altar that God communicates, reveals his will, reveals his purposes. All the good plans he has, wonderful as they are, they are activated by your altar. If your altar is not active, they are not activated. I'll give you a scripture to that. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 to 14 it says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for good, not for evil. To give you a good ending. But you'll have to go and pray. You'll have to seek me and search for me with all your heart. Do we know that scripture? Yeah. Jeremiah, the plans are good. They are all wonderful. But you'll have to go and pray. So he's talking about the altar. The personal altar has to be active to activate the good plans that God has for you. You have two plans on your life. One is of the devil, another one is of God. So if you don't pray and you are not, your altar is not active, it is Satan's plan which will continually interfere with the plans of God. When you pray, you allow the plans of God to do what? Because the doorway is our thinking pattern. You see, God works only when we think like he thinks. Eh? Renew your mind. Eh? Uh, 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 Romans 12. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you offer yourself as a what? Uh -huh. So in other words, you, the spirit, you offer your body, which is the sacrifice. So your body is the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the priest brought an ox, brought a goat, brought a sheep. You bring your own body. You don't bring a sheep. You don't bring a goat. What do you bring? Your body. You are the priest. You are also the what? The sacrifice. What is the sacrifice? Your body. Your body wants to watch pornography. You say no. That is a sacrifice. The body enjoys all these things. It enjoys gossip. When people are gossiping there, you feel like your body is being put. You say, no. So that is the living sacrifice he's talking about. Uh -huh. You refuse to listen to the gossip, to people who are eh, marrying others. My, so your body is still alive to sin, and you say, no. Offer your body as a living what? Uh -huh. Holy. Hmm? Maybe I need to read it. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 12 of 1. I'll read it again so that... Can we read together? I beseech you... Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, let, so you see, he says by, by the masses of God, why is it he's connected? This one part is not showing. Okay. By the masses of God. Mm. By the masses of God. Well, I don't understand why it is showing, it's doing this. But, but we have the text. The text is saying. So, present your bodies. So the body, who, who is presenting the body? You, you. You, the spirit, is the real you. The body is what you are presenting as a living sacrifice. Why does he say living? 
because the Old Testament animals were dead before they could be put on the altar. Yes. So the, he's comparing and contrasting the Old Testament sacrifices to yours. Yours today is living. Your body is still alive. Uh-huh. So it's living. But you're constantly putting it under control. So that is the laying down of your. So you want to sleep on, but you say, no, body, wake up. Yeah? Especially for me now, I'm having a problem to wake up because of the cold. <laughs> <laughs> in Uganda, we have summer all through the year. I wonder how can people manage to live here? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I look at you and I'm surprised. How you people do you live? Okay, so, so my body wants to remain under the blanket. And I say, get out. <laughs> so that's a living what? Sacrifice. You say, <laughs> your body enjoys sleep and you say, no, you must wake up. So that is what it means. Your body wants to eat and to say, no, today I'm going to fast. To keep shouting, as I said yesterday. Ah! I said, no, stop it. <laughs> We're going to fast. So it is still, especially when you pass by Chick-fil-A and eh? so <laughs> KFC. So your body is still living <laughs> and you tell it, stop. So it's a living sacrifice. It says, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Another version says act of worship. Eh? Your reasonable act of what? So you see our bodies now housing the temple, the true worship now takes place in our spirits in this physical temple which is our body. The body has to be brought under control so that our spirit can freely worship God. Every time the body hinders that. When we say no, body Listen, obey. Then we offer the worship to God. So that's what he's talking about here. So, and then the next part says, do not be conformed to this world. Because the body and the world are connected. You know the, three, the trinity of the devil? What is it? Satan, the world, and the flesh. The world appeals to us through the body, desires of the flesh. That's why you have to bring it under control because that is the door through which the devil uses. Satan, using the desires of this world and the flesh, they fight against the trinity of God. They are incensed against each other. The world against the father, the flesh against the spirit, and Satan himself against the son. Do you know that trinity? Yes, the Bible says, do not love the world, neither the things in the world. For he who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So the world is incensed against the Father, the Father's kingdom. And then it says about the flesh, do not walk in the flesh. Walk in the spirit, then you will not fulfill the works of the... So the spirit and the flesh are... Then for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested so that he may destroy him that had the power over, that that is the devil. So Satan directly against Jesus, the world directly against the Father, and the flesh directly against the what? The Spirit. So that's why he's saying here, do not be conformed to this what? This world. This world is... Uh, warring against the purposes of God in your life. It is the Father who has a plan about your life. That plan which he did or had before the foundation of the world, you live through it. It is predetermined, but you come and seek me. You'll come and search for me. Then you'll find that plan. Then you'll fulfill it. Amen? Amen? Now the world wants to block you to hinder you from doing that. And so he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the battlefield is in the mind. The way we think, the value system, the interests, all that. So that is the problem. And so the world, if we think like the world, the purposes of God cannot be fulfilled in our life. Why do we have to be renewed in our mind that you may prove what is good 
permissive and then perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is revealed to us in three levels. When you are first born again, it's good versus evil. As you grow, you realize there are things which are good, but God permits, but they are not his perfect will. Finally, when you grow and mature, you realize that is the perfect will of God, which makes the difference. And so that's what he says. You learn to grow from just good versus evil to the permissive and then to the perfect will of God. We do that only if we have offered our bodies as a living sacrifice, as we renew our minds, because once our minds are not renewed, our carnal mind is enmity against God. Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is what? Enemy against God. So you have an enemy in your mind. Do you reveal your secrets to your enemies? Huh? No. Uh-huh. So you cannot access God's secrets when you have an enemy in your mind. So he has, he's saying, remove the enemy, then I will show you my secrets. Uh-huh. So that's the way we get transformed. And then uh, he reveals his, power, his secrets, he reveals his power for us, and then we become effective wherever we are. Now, this is, this is on a personal level. Now we are talking about on a personal level, how, God, how we access the mind of God on our personal altar. Practically, this is how it works. You choose and decide that every day, I'm going to have, you can start with 20 minutes. You can start with 30 minutes, whatever you can manage. But it's always important that you give God the best time of the year, I mean of, of the day. Always the best time of the day before everything else comes in. Personally, I learned that many, many years ago. That if I give God the best time of my day, then it's like I've committed the whole day into the Lord's hands. Jesus lived a day at a time. Every single day was important because he only had 42 months to do his ministry, three and a half years. But in 42 months, he says, I've finished. Many of us take 60 years without even scratching the what? 42 months, he has finished, three and a half years. He said, I've finished, complete. 42 months? Because every single day he would wake up a great while before dawn and he would go and pray. And the father would tell him, today, you're going to do A, B, C, D. That's what you have to accomplish today. The issue is not how long you've lived. No, how well have you lived? It's no good to live here for 100 years when all of it is wasted. There are people who lived 900 years and all they have in the book, in the book of Genesis. So and so lived 300 years, he had uh, boys and girls, and then lived that. All those years wasted nothing. All they did was to produce boys and what? Girls. Have you read that in Genesis? <laughs> yeah? So God, <laughs> it's not the length of time you live, but how well you did, you lived. So Jesus would wake up, and the Father would give him the direction. Today you are going to Jerusalem. You'll sit on a colt, on a donkey. You'll be fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9. It is written about you. Rejoice, daughter of Zion. Your king is coming to you, riding on a what? On a donkey. That's what you're fulfilling today. And then when you get to the city, Jerusalem, you enter the temple, remove all the people that are what? Uh, are sailing there. Get your belt, remove them. There you'll be fulfilling <laughs> this passage of scripture. The zeal of my father has eaten me up. So he, he, he shows him all the verses, the scriptures he's going to fulfill that day. You see the point I'm making? Uh -huh. So that's how Jesus lived very, very, uh, 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 deliberately, he knew that I have a limited time and I have to accomplish all this. And after 33 and a half years, he was done. He says, I've finished. I've done it all. All the Father called me to do. Now, how did he manage? The secret is on the time, that personal altar, where you connect with God on a daily basis. 
Many years ago, when I had just gotten saved about a year, I calculated my tithe on time. And I realized that 24 hours, the tithe is 2 hours and 24 minutes. Yes, and I said that I was going to do, to do that so that in every day I have at least 2 hours and what? 22 minutes. You can round it up to 2 hours and a half or 3 hours. But I knew that that was very good for me to give the best time of my day to the Lord in prayer and in meditation in his word. If you start that day like that, that we are still on the altar. How do we create powerful intercessors? How do we create powerful prayer warriors? That's what I'm dealing with. This is the practical way. Every single day, you set aside the best time of the day and you give it to the Lord on a daily basis. That's what we teach our intercessors. If they conquer that particular part, you, you have strong warriors. If they fail to conquer that, you can't. Coming together, uh, praying, that prayer is good only if the people who are praying themselves are strong prayer. What? Because God doesn't want prayers. He wants prayers. Not the words, but the people. Uh -huh. Not prayers, but what? The people. Not the words, but the people. That's the key. So you, you will make the people. We are now talking about you, the altar of God. You, the altar of God, is what counts most before God. The condition of your heart. To God, that is more important. You, you may speak one sentence, and it may have more power than 20 sentences because the condition of your heart. So how do we make such people? How do we make those kind of prayer warriors? They, they build a, a, a disciplined life. So on every, every single day, you start your day before the Lord. You may start with 30 minutes, if that's your beginning, or one hour, whatever, but the time you spend before God should include especially that time when you in the word of God. The word of God is important because when you read the word, he's the one speaking to you. When you are praying, you are the one speaking. And prayer has to have those two aspects. Where God speaks to you, and then you speak to him. What is more important is not you speaking, but him speaking. So what you say is not what is important, as is what he says. So you, we train our spirits to hear him in the passages of scripture, really in that condition of your heart in the morning when you, nobody has bothered you yet. You have woken up, everybody is still quiet, your husband or your wife is still asleep maybe, <laughs> or, but you're alone. You are able to read the word meditatively and we teach our people to always write their meditation. Writing your meditation helps to organize those thoughts Later on, two years, when you read those meditations, you'll be surprised that the Lord really spoke to you and you actually had revelation into it. So that time we spend alone with God is so important. Start with the short time that you can manage. Conquer that before you increase the time. Make sure you have mastered that. If it is 30 minutes that you can manage, do that. If it's 45, if it's one hour, but master it and make it uh, such a way that you stop everything else. And by the way, the discipline of waking up is not so much in the waking up, it's in the what time you go to sleep. Many years, I learned that many years ago. The discipline is not in the waking up. No, the discipline is when do you go to sleep. Because you have all these programs on the TV that you keep you awake until 1 a.m. You will not be able to wake up <laughs> to pray when you sleep at what? Or oh, let me wait for that program. Or oh, let me wait for another TV. So, so many of these things steal our time. I can see some people smiling because they know this is where the biggest problem is. So your, your big, biggest discipline is not at the waking up. The biggest discipline is disciplining, you are going to sleep. What time do you, do you go to sleep is so important. You say, no, it's time. Everybody is enjoying and they see you walking away. 
<laughs> That's the, your sacrifice, a living sacrifice. The program is in the middle of where it is, uh, uh, whatever, what, what do you enjoy most? What are the programs that are in the evenings? What are those beautiful, wonderful programs that people enjoy in the evenings? On TV, on what? Huh? Fox News. Fox News. <laughs> Fox News. <laughs> now, and now I'm not against news because for me, I listen to the news, but I'm very deliberate. Because what is news today, by tomorrow or the next day, it is no longer news. So I can choose to pick what I can really listen to because you never finish it. You understand that? Yeah. Yes, I have a, a colleague, a pastor. I was teaching about Bible meditation. And he said, I used to wait for seven different news. In, in our country, we have so many televisions. And they bring different, different types. And so he would listen to all of them from 7 o'clock to midnight. Every day. And he says, what news are you? Are you much better than me now? Because you, what, what, what do you, tomorrow there will be no news. You understand that? Yeah. Just pick one if you want, because as an intercessor or what you may need to know certain things. But limit it. Because even what you do not see on the news, if you are an intercessor, the Lord will tell it to you. He will bring it to you if you really need it. So you can't spend six hours on Fox News. Kindly pray for the neighbor and say, Lord, deliver my brother, my sister from Fox News. <laughs> from the Fox News, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's just mere curiosity or what. But, but the, the serious note on a serious note. So you choose, I will listen to the news, but at such and such a time, you can start with 10 o'clock. For me, many years ago, I made a decision that I would go to sleep at nine. My fellow young people you know, looked at me and I said to me, the very early morning time is so important that I can sacrifice anything for that. Because I'm not here for all those things. I'm pursuing a calling on my life and I can only fulfill it if I maintain that time with the Lord. And I started to read my Bible because my day is so busy. Pastor Mark is my witness, you know, in, anywhere in Uganda, even when I'm here, but in Uganda I'm so busy. You have all these assignments, you have this meeting, you have this meeting. So the whole day is packed. But how can you maximize the day? Only if you've spent a good time with the Lord. So for 37 years now, I spent three hours in the morning from 3 a.m. to 6 in the Word and in prayer. I've done that for 37 years. And that's when I do my studies. That's when I do my prayer. By the time the day starts, I've had a, a whole time. And I made a decision when I was still a, a, a young man. Very young. And I told my colleagues, for you, you can continue in what you want to do. My calling is very important, so therefore I can sacrifice anything for this. And that's how I learned to pray for the nation. And the Lord would bring issues, praying for people, praying for... What you pray for, you can never finish. Isn't it? You can't. I pray for my fellow minister. I pray for uh, Sifan here. I pray for Caris. I pray. You have so much to pray for that you always, you know, the time, you know, just limits you. But you have to make a decision. It's a decision you make. Think about it this way, brethren. You can spend the time here on earth with all the amenities and all the things, but you never fulfill the purposes of God for your life. What does it profit a man? Yeah. To hit the old world and lose your own? Yes. <laughs> and you get there and you never, never. I don't know how other people feel, but for me that's the, prime, the priority number one. Yeah. I can let go anything else for that. It's so important that there's nothing as important as that. Not Fox News. Not anything. <laughs> it is so important that I fulfill God's will for my what? For my life. It's more important than anything else. So I can sacrifice anything for it. We can when you make that decision. You see why many people are not fulfilled? Money does not satisfy 
Positions do, don't. None of those things satisfy. It's only when you are doing and fulfilling God's will for your life. That's when you live a very fulfilled life. You can live a worry-free life, anxious-free life. If you live that time with the Lord, he brings so much joy. You're always satisfied. You are never moved because you live your life before the Lord. You're a happy person, your marriage, your life, your children. This is so key. You can't compare it with anything else. We can't. So this personal altar is so important. Upon this altar, all others, everything else depends on this one. If the devil steals this one, you waste so much time in things that don't matter. There is a day, you see when people come here, our African people come in America and Europe to, 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 to make money, they're economic refugees, they run away from Uganda, they come here and then make money to go back. One of them had come, gone to UK and when he got there very quickly because he started to get this, get that, you know, he would make a lot of money but he would spend it. Yeah. Buying this car, competing with the other one. One day, because he did not have the proper papers, he was roughed up by the police. Do you have the papers, are you? No, I came from Uganda, where are your papers? Now, they don't even give you time to go back home, to park. They take you to the airport straight and they deport you. Now, all the lavish lifestyle that he had lived for almost 15 years, buying this car, buying the other car, you know, having all this gold and what, what. All her, her money was spent in this. And then deported and gets back and there's not even a house. Gets a relative who puts him in a, 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 a kitchen house. Now, when you listen to that kind of story, that's exactly what most people are when you're deported back home. A time will come, you may not, not even know it, when the Lord says, Ambassador, come back home. You have lavishly spent your time and you never transferred anything back home. You spent it all here. You squandered your time. Time is life that is measured out to us in which we fulfill God's will. Let me define time again. Time is life that God has measured to you here on earth to fulfill his will. We live in another world. It's not a world of time. It's eternity. It doesn't use time. No. The other life, it is not time. But when he puts us here, he measures this time and says, between this and this, you fulfill my will. Isn't it important, therefore, that you sleep early so that you can have a good time in the morning to know what God wants you to do the next day. Isn't it worth it to let it go of so many other things that you can really know on a very, every single day? You see, when you take care of the pennies, the pounds will take care of themselves. Every single day, if you pray through that day and say, Lord, today, I don't know what you organize for me today. The th today is Wednesday? Yes. Yes. Eh? Yes. 25th? Yes. So if you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, today, I know you have a plan for today. Help me remove those things which are not part of your plan. Please help me. Those time wasters that always come, unnecessary phone call. And please help me today to fulfill what you want me to do. What? Today. Include that in your prayer every single day. So that that day is well lived. You'll be surprised. Two things will happen. God will remove so many things that are useless. Which only come to waste your what? Your time. But also number two. Because of that time you've given him in the morning. This is what happens. You want to go meet somebody or you want to do something. He'll save those many hours that you would have wasted. 
You drove to a certain place, and whoever you wanted is not there. That whole three hours are wasted. Another two hours. God will save you all that. You'll meet the right person at the right place. Sometimes you're entering the you know, shop, and you say, oh, I've been looking for you, and that's all you needed. And he, so God saves you so much. And because of committing the best time of your day to him on a daily basis. Take care of the pennies. The pounds will take care of themselves. Why did Jesus say give us this day our daily bread? Because every single day there is a plan. There is a season for everything. God has created in time what he calls seasons. You enter into his plans according to his seasons, according to his seasons. When you miss a season, you have to go around in circle before you come back to get to that. That's a very, very serious thing. And on that very day, when you didn't pray, when that's the day when an opportunity was supposed to have come to, to catapult you to the next level. And you miss it, and then it takes another five years or three years because you never know which day, which is the day of your visitation. You don't know it. That's why every day is important. Jesus made sure every day is well lived out. So you pray, I'm emphasizing the importance of a daily time you spend alone with God. It is that important. Because on that very day, which sometimes you've squandered, wasted, that's when a big door may open and you'll not notice it. Or where you should have taken a right turn, you take a left turn. Or where you should have taken a turn, you just continue. So our lives are like that. Israel was supposed to have entered the promised land only a few months after leaving Egypt. They missed that opportunity, and it took them a whole cycle of what? 40 years. What a waste. What a waste. 40 years. They are these revolving, I use these revolving doors as an example. You have to wait until, you know, in order to. Yes. You understand the revolving doors? Yes. yes, our seasons in life are like that. When you are supposed to enter and you, you miss, then you have to wait until it what? Yes. yes, that is the point. That is the serious point. Because the opportunity and the door that the Lord may have wanted you to enter into, you miss it, and then you take a whole circle. That's why many people live a frustrated life. They don't have joy. They have all this, but you try this, you think when I get to this level, I'll be okay, and then you find it's empty. You go into So the whole life is wasted. By the time you're done, you feel like you're empty. Because none of those things were meant to satisfy us. The only thing that is meant to satisfy us is doing the will of God for our life. So you feel empty. Those things don't satisfy. What does it profit a man? Yeah? It all those things. And lose the very important life which God has ordained for all of us. So every single day, therefore, you decide I'm going to wake up and I'm going to spend time in the presence of God. You set goals in a country, this, this first year, one month of January, I teach on setting goals. And I teach people how they do set up these goals. Uh, and I put them, let, let me give an example. I know some of you already have this, but in case you don't, it's important that you have specific goals for your life. And they, are, they help you not to waste time. Setting personal goals. Look at this. I don't know whether this comes out. Do you read? <laughs> Are you able to see this? Okay. So, I tell them something like this. Let me see. Let me start here. You, you have sections of your life. For example, let me start with this one. 
the, the spiritual goal. It's important that as the year begins, 2023, you decide, at least this year, I will, uh, I will read through the Bible uh, in NIV, or if you can read it through the year, or two years, okay? You decide this is 2023 20, and 2024. You may even use three years, okay? You, you don't necessarily have to be one year, but you say, I'm going to read through the Bible in the next three years. Let me use that simple. So that you, when you do that, most of our programs will help you if you set 2023, 2024 and 2025, if I'm to read through the Bible, in three years, how many, verse, how many f- chapters do I need to read per what? Per day. Most of those programs, they do, they help you that. In other words, you have a spiritual goal. You have a goal you've set, which is to do with personal devotion. So I'll read through the Bible by December 2025. 23, 24, and 25. So in other words, you've set it for the next three years, at least I read through NIV or King James or New American Standard. So you have a goal in that particular area of reading the Bible. There are disciplines that are so key for you to fulfill the purpose of God in your life. One of them is Bible reading and meditation. Second one is learning to pray, prayer continues to become a lifestyle rather than an event. Number three, witnessing, speaking to somebody about Christ. That is, uh, these are disciplines that Jesus himself taught in Matthew five, when you pray, Hmm? when you fast, when you give. These, These are specific disciplines that help a believer to grow. Reading the Bible, prayer, taking off a day, you know, can be 12 hours, can be a meal of prayer, of fasting, then giving, then uh, uh, six, there are six, hmm? coming together and meeting with other brothers. So those, you make a specific goals for that. And so in your prayer every morning, you are considering these goals that you've set. I read through the Bible that, I'll set aside three days alone with God every what? Now, for ministers, for preachers, for pastors, for ministers in any field, I encourage you to always have the time when you're alone with what? With God. I know it's such a big issue here because it's such a big issue. But there's no way you get personal growth in a team. Personal growth is personal. You meet with God. You exercise that discipline and say, I need, you may not start with uh, maybe three days. You can start with that day. Get used to that. Then you have two days alone. You tell your wife or your husband, my phone will be off in case of emergency. This, and then you're just there alone. You may not necessarily be fasting. Just have time alone with God. What do you achieve? Be still and know that I am God. You see, our minds are always shouting and we never give God time. And this is a discipline that we have to learn in our day. Revelation comes in those times that you set aside alone with God. That's when God starts to speak to you personally and you'll be amazed by the time you come out, the changes that start to come into your life. We can't be too busy for God. You can't say, oh, that is too long. How come we have time to go for vacation and all that? And we have a whole week. Why is it so difficult to have time with God alone? And say, I'm going to make this a discipline in my life. I have made a discipline of this in my life for decades. For me, my wife knows when that time comes, they don't call me. I'm just there, except when it's an emergency. So there is a special line which nobody knows except my family. So when I'm there, nobody else can reach me. Brethren, these are important things. This is the way we build an altar, a very strong what? Altar. This is now practical. This is not theory. 
we are, we, we are out to take America back. God doesn't want prayers. He wants prayers. He wants people. He wants the people who are going to wrench the devil and get America what? Back. If they are prayer warriors, this is how we build them. We build them like this. So these are smart goals. Smart goals, we all know the smart goals. Eh? Smart. Specific. Measurable. Attainable. Realistic. And what? And time. And so that, that's what I'm, I'm doing here. You, have, uh, you set a goal. and you, So you have a goal on the spiritual front. Uh, here. The intellectual part where you, you read, you study. The physical one. I do some exercise, I'll increase, I'll increase my daily exercise in the gym from 10, min, 10 minutes to what? 20. And my goal is to cut weight from how many to what? Feeling dash dash. Uh, uh, I'll stop what? Eating what? Junk during which day of the week? <laughs> okay. Then there is the financial goal. So you can see, you can have goals on the ministry and the social life. I'll witness to one person at least every day or once a week. Uh, I'll work or serve at church twice. I'll get some time when I can come and offer my services to my church. I'll ensure I do not come late in the practice or church service. I can come early and do something. Okay? That is your part. Then family. I pray for my wife or my husband and my children. How often? That's a goal you set. Those small, small prayers, even if you just mention your children once every day in your prayer, that is so important. So important before God. It's the most and the most important inheritance you can leave for your children. There are six different inheritance parents can leave for their children, but the most important is that one prayer. Yeah. Even when you have not been able to leave a big estate, you've left something very, very rich. Yes. Esau had all these goats and sheep. He never valued the spiritual one. Joseph, Jacob did. For him, he didn't have the sheep. What, what he had was the prayer. He said, sell me your birthright. Daddy, Bless me. He understood the value of the spiritual blessing that parents give to their what? Their children. Esau looked at the material. Eh? Now, if you look back now, the sheep, the goats, the land that Esau got, is it worth? It's now desert. <laughs> Things of this world are like that. Esau, all that he could bequeath his children are all those material things. Jacob bequeathed his children the spiritual blessing that continues on. Do you see the difference? Yes. What is it that you are leaving your children? You do on a daily basis. Those small prayers, you mention them by name. Yes. Paul said, I mention you by what? By name every day in all my prayers. Parents, you have so much power over your children. But the best you can do is to constantly do what? Bless them. So have a goal on that particular, on, on praying for your children. Then how about taking your wife out? Hmm? At least every, I, I can't hear you ladies. I see you, you're not happy at all. Yeah? I see ladies are not happy at all. What is happening? Now, yeah? I'll take, and you make that a goal. I'll take my wife. Eh? <laughs> now, for us, you know, in our country, most, most men don't do this. Maybe here you do it. But going out and having times alone with your wife, with your husband, is a very, very important aspect. Because it doesn't matter how much you succeed if your marriage is what? Failing. That's why it's so important for anybody, any minister, any believer, your marriage, your spouse is so important. Is only next to God. Yes, After God, the next person is your spouse. Then children. So these are the issues of the altar. 
that I wanted to emphasize today, the practical part of it. We can talk about high sounding spiritual language, but if we don't bring it down to the practicals like this, you'll never build a strong prayer team. They'll talk good, wonderful words and wonderful prayers. There are people, when they pray, eh, they use such beautiful Elizabethan English with commas, with semicolon, with the full stop. With God, God is not interested in the words. He's more interested in the what? In the heart. Now, this, these are issues of the heart. Praise the Lord. There are times when you can't even speak good words, but you just sigh, yeah, groan. God will interpret the groanings even when you don't have the right words. But when the heart is full of God, burdened by God, those prayers you will honor. Because the Holy Spirit even helps our infirmities. We don't even know what to pray. Even when we know what to pray, we don't know how to pray it. So the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities with groanings which cannot be uttered with articulate speech, the Bible says. So this is an example of how we can build a very strong prayer team. If we build the people and they build on a personal level, by the time we come back here, fire is going out and destroying altars all over Colorado. Thank you very much. I'll now open it up to... into the question piece, I saw this yesterday, that um, when I was standing next to the person that asked the question, the phone of somebody next to them went off. So if you could today, please make sure your phones, if they're not already silent, um, and if you do want to ask a question, make sure you raise your hand up high. Down here, we can't see this, so raise your hand up high, and make sure uh, we're going to hold the mic for you. So if you have any questions for Bishop Joshua, please raise your hand. So regarding fasting, the what? Regarding fasting, yeah. sorry, I'll let you know that. Um, what is your guideline for fasting? How often do you fast? When do you fast? Um, what kind of fasts are there? Um, and not regarding casting out demons specifically, but I do remember, like in Mark chapter nine, the uh, disciples asked Jesus, "Why couldn't we cast out this demon?" He said, "Well, this can only come from fasting and prayer." Mm. And I've always wondered, well, should they have known that? Um, what else do I, don't, do I not know about fasting? Okay. L- let me answer something about fasting. Fasting is when Jesus was teaching about these disciplines I've mentioned, he said, when you pray, don't pray like this. You remember that? He gave guidelines of how to pray. And then he said, when you give, because he expected his disciples to pray, he expected them to do what? To give. And then in verse 16, Matthew 5, 16 said, when you fast. He didn't say if you fast. He said when? Beca- yes, because he expected us to do what? To fast. Because in fasting, fasting doesn't change God. God is the same before you fast, while you fast, and after you fast. There is a tendency for some people to present fasting as if it will change God and you stretch and go, hey, hey, okay, okay, I'll give you a No, fasting doesn't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> you, you don't force him to give you it. It only helps you to bring your flesh under control because then your spirit becomes sharper. Even non-believers, witches fast. Because when they fast, they are so much tuned in the spirit realm. The fasting helps you to tune so much in the what? The spirit realm. Now, I encourage people when you fast, you should get time to read the word. Because some people, they think that just fasting, fasting alone is good by itself, but it's good for you to spend enough time in the what? In the word. Especially, you you can choose a day in the week when you can do what? When you can fast. Say, uh, I work for, say, five days, but I have Wednesdays when I'm free. I'll use that day when I can get time alone with what? With God and do it as a fast. I've practiced fasting myself, and I know the benefits are immense. Jesus, as you mentioned, 
with the disciples. He said, this kind cannot go without what? Prayer and fasting. Matthew 17, 21. They had been fighting this demon for a long time. And for him, he came and spoke one word. So in fasting, you, 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 you connect with God. Your flesh is brought under control. And the, the Bible says in Psalm 35, verse 12, I humbled my soul through fasting. Okay, that was David. So your soul is humbled. All of us are proud by nature. Are you aware that you are proud? Yeah, there are some people who don't know. But we are by nature proud. In fact, when you, for you, you start saying, for me, I'm glad I'm not proud. You're already proud that you're humble. So pride is like that. So <laughs> pride, is, pride is so <laughs> subtle in our soul that it takes that time of fasting to expose that pride. And David said, it helps us to humble our soul. And, and in that time of fasting, you're telling God, I've come to the end of myself, and I ask you to help me. But even when you're not desperately asking for anything, just taking that time alone, being with God, it really helps a great deal. It also has physical benefits. Because we eat up till what time? 10 p.m.? And the body works the whole night. Eh? Sends the, you know, changes, it sends all the blood here, starts to, to, to what? Harambe, harambe, working on the food that, as soon as it is finished, you break the fast, breakfast. Then it starts all over again. It's like that for years and years. So the body needs to rest sometime. Yeah. When it can just relax and there is no food. And then it, there is, there is, the, the, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 58, there are so many healthy benefits that flow out of fasting, even without you considering the spiritual benefits. There are so many. They have even mentioned it there in the book of Isaiah chapter 58. So it's a very good practice, especially for intercessors. As you start to grow in intercession, the times when the Lord will tell you to pray and fast for people. People, I'm involved in deliverance, and I pray for people, deliver them. So many times the Lord tells you to pray and fast for somebody who can't do it for themselves. Okay? So as you grow in intercession, as you grow in spiritual warfare, that is something you cannot avoid. Especially when you are dealing with the cities, with nations. It's part and parcel. Okay? Another. There was, there were, there was a hand. Why are you putting up? Oh. That was about okay. So I've answered it. Did, did I answer it fully or there was something remaining? So do you, do you consider fasting to be food? To be food? Like in a, yeah. Is it only food? Or in, like in America, we fast mm -hmm. television or mm -hmm. social media. Yeah. Have you, that can you, still be, but the biblical definition, that can also be because the, what you're dealing with is actually the flesh. You're dealing with the what? With the flesh. But still, abstaining from food is part and parcel of food. is such a very integral part of the, of the body. Pleasure. What you're dealing with is pleasure. The pleasure of the body. That's why it will shout more than anything else. When you are, you know, social media, TV. But when it comes to food, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, honestly, I've, I've practiced pray, uh, fasting and you come out totally different if you do it the right way. Don't, don't start with the length. That's not the important thing. It's not the many days. There are different days in the Bible. There's the fasting of one day, then three days by Esther, four days by Cornelius, seven days by the men of Jabesh, uh, 14 days uh, by the then 21 days of Daniel, then 40 days of Moses, and so on. There are so many different fasts. Uh, some are partial, uh, others are complete, like Esther fast was three days and three nights, 72 hours without food and water. The body should never go beyond that time. Esther, do you remember Esther? Yeah. We call that Esther fast. No food, no water for what? For three days. Anything beyond that, you must continue drinking because it can affect your what? 
your body. Actually, the true hunger of the physically can only come after 40 days. Jesus fasted, but he was drinking. After he had fasted, the Bible says he was what? He wasn't thirsty because he was what? Drinking. The first thing Jesus did was human. Our bodies come, my brother, let me illustrate it. Our bodies were made in such a way that every time we eat, Chick-fil-A, KFC, (laughs) (laughs) much of it is is stored along the what? (laughs) Here, you can see some of it is here. Now, when you fast a long prayer, time of fasting, 40 days or 21 or whatever, uh, the, the body starts to pull all that food that is stored. That's why during that long fast, if it is 40 days, then you have to keep what? Drinking. Then it will use up all the stored food in different parts, in everywhere that stored food is. You start to burn it. True anger comes back after 40 days. The rest of this hunger is, oh, I'm hungry. That is not true anger. That is habitual hunger. It's not true. It's false. If you are used to waking up at 7 and eating, you, by 7 you will be hungry. You eat at 10, you will be hungry at 10. At 1, at 4, at, you can eat all through the 24 hours and every time you are used, you will be hungry, hungry because it is habitual hunger. It's a habit. But the true hunger will come back after what? After 40 days. Then the body has totally removed all the stored food. Now, don't start with 40 days. You'll get discouraged. <laughs> start with those short, short times. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay? Um, hello. How does praying in the spirit or speaking in our unknown, our language, fit into your personal prayer time? I know personally I get into works by doing this. and So praying in the spirit. Yeah. I'll just say, how does so that fit what in? What is the question? This? How does praying in the spirit fit into like your personal prayer yeah. time. Okay. The praying in tongues, look at what God did. God knew that our mind is easily assailed by the enemy. And yet, the power we have can only be used if we speak. But our speaking comes from our mind. So what the devil does is to come and clog your what? your mind and confuse you while you're praying. Say, did you, are you sure in the kitchen, did you put food in the, so so, so he keeps disrupting you constantly. Uh In order that your mind will not what? Concentrate. Even when you concentrate, now I'm going to pray for sister. All of a sudden something else comes and goes up and goes out. Keeps disturbing your prayer. Now, so he gave us a prayer language in which your spirit is the one praying. How do you like that? Yes. In the normal way, yes. your, 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 your mind prays through your body, your lips. Yes. But in, when you're praying in the spirit, it is your spirit yes. jumping this pune eh, mind and praying directly. Your spirit is using your body. And when the spirit is praying, it's the Holy Spirit praying through you. So that prayer, the devil cannot interfere with because he does not even know what you're praying for. Uh That's why it becomes so powerful. So you choose the person you're going to pray for. That is the will. That is the decision, the choice you make in your mind. But the moment you start praying, it is the spirit using your what? Your body, your mouth. And you start to pray according to the perfect will of God. So that is why it is so important for you to learn to pray in what? In tongues. It is a prayer language given to us to make us effective. Romans chapter 8, yes. verse 26 and 27 says this. We do not know what to pray. Even when we know what to pray, we don't know how to pray it. So the Holy Spirit himself prays through our spirit with intercession and groanings which cannot be uttered with articulate speech. So he who searches the heart 
knows the mind of the spirit. So he makes intercession through a saints according to the perfect will of God. So the Holy Spirit is praying through your spirit and using your lips. So you, it's so good to pray in tongues. When you have prayed long enough and you have used your tongues, you start to interpret. There is a command which says, he who prays in tongues, pray that you may what? Yes, when you've used your tongues a, long, a lot in prayer, you come to a time when you start to hear what you are praying. For me, that's how I do most of intercession when I'm praying for people. Then when you have prayed long enough, you start to hear what you are praying about this sister, this brother. So you start to get the word of knowledge and word of wisdom through that prayer. You start to understand what the Holy Spirit is praying because it's, it is him praying through you. Then you hear what he was praying. Say, oh, so that means the sister is going through this problem, which she never told you because now the Holy Spirit is praying through you. Is that clear? So it's important that you practice it when you're driving, when you are moving, when you wake up in the morning. Now the devil will fight that so much that he'll start to make you doze because the moment the mind is idle, the mind doesn't want to be what? Idle. So you can decide to pray, you can leave the sitting room and come, I mean the bedroom and come into the what? The sitting room, is that true? <laughs> yes, so you, you pray in tongues. When you start to feel like quick, you can walk around praying in tongues. And pray long enough. As you do that continually, you'll start to interpret those tongues. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hope I'm not the only mom with this question. Um, so my baby relies on me to eat for milk. So I'm kind of confused on like how to fast or when I should fast. So you don't fast. have to fast when you are. You have to feed your baby when you are pregnant. It's not such a big issue before the Lord. The real issue is not so much the... the, the um, fasting is really dealing with those issues of pleasures of our bodies which keep hindering us. But it's not something that you have to really do by... The Holy Spirit will guide you. Yeah, the Spirit will guide you. Don't feel like you are ob obligated to do this. Even everything that we do for the Lord, God loves a cheerful giver, for example. Nobody should ever force you to give. You give willingly, but he teaches you it is good. The same with fasting, the same with prayer, the same with everything else that we do to, for the Lord. Mm. Remaining with two, and then I'll be done. Pastor, you... Am I, uh, is it okay? Because it's only quarter. Yeah. Okay, two. Okay. Okay. Bishop, I've been um, relentlessly pursuing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've yet to been able to speak in tongues. What must I do? Nothing. You just receive. The way you receive the salvation, he gives us free. The Bible says, he, 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 when, when we come to him, he will no way cast out. So, we receive our salvation by faith and you receive by faith. So the same with speaking tongues. We, when the, uh, uh, like for example in, in church, in service, pastor calls people to come forward, to be prayed for, to receive the Holy Spirit, you just open up your, and the Lord will fill you. For me, I got filled on the 27th of May, 1985, I was in my bed. In my bed, I yearned to be filled. And when I was still awake in my bed, and started to sing, and I got filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how I got filled. I remember the day, because it was so phenomenal for me. 27th of May, <laughs> 1985. I remember it very well. So you can, by faith, receive. And then it is you who speaks. He doesn't speak for you. You release your tongue, and then you speak. about generational curses. I've heard that, you know, because Jesus died on the cross, he took all our curses. But I still see things in my kids mm -hmm. that my 
parents and grandparents did. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you, I mean, do you believe there's such a thing as generational curses? And if so, what do you do about them? Mm -hmm. And if not, I'm kind of confused about how to pray for my kids. Like I said, I see them repeating mm -hmm. a lot of the same thing that's in my family. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me put it, if it can help any other who has a similar question. Everything Jesus did is complete. Completely complete, perfectly perfect, nothing lacking. But the way we receive it is different. For example, he died for the whole world. Isn't that what the Bible says? Yes. Is the whole world going to heaven? Why? Uh -huh. So whatever wonderful things he did is complete, it's for us. But the way we receive it, somebody has to preach what he did. People have to hear it, receive it, believe it, then it helps them. That's why we go to preach to them. All those people were saved legally, but it can only become true when they accept it. But they have to hear. The Bible says, how will they hear unless somebody preaches to them? Okay, so you did one time believe. That's why you are saved. The same with healing. By his stripes, all of us were healed. The whole world. But there are Christians who are still sick. It's not because his work is not complete. His work is complete. Completely complete, perfectly perfect. But the way we receive it, somebody has to preach it, teach it, explain it, then those who hear will believe, respond, accept, embrace that truth, and then it, they get it. Now it's the same with curses. When Jesus hung on the cross, he did not only take our sins, he also took our sicknesses. He also took all our curses. But for people to benefit from that truth, somebody needs to preach it, teach it, explain it. The same way they preach salvation, they preach healing, they have to preach about these curses, how they operate in families. Then when the people hear, they accept the message, believe it, and then those curses are broken off their lives. Poverty, lack, failure, defeat, leap progress, all these are the curses Jesus took on the cross. That's why Jesus told those Jews who had believed in him, you need to continue in my word. Yes. Then you'll be my disciples indeed. For then you'll know the truth, and the truth you know shall set you free. He was telling believers, meaning they were not fully free from curses, from infirmities, from poverty, from disease, from all those things. These are believers. They have to continue in the truth so that the truth will now set them free. So have I explained the curses? So what you see in your family is true. It, many of our families are like that. So when God calls Abraham, he said, dissociate yourself. Break that link. Because in the spirit realm, they continue to claim you. The legal ground to break the link is baptism. In baptism, we are supposed to die to our families. Do you understand that? And we are adopted in the new family. The laws of adoption require that you denounce the old parenthood. You cannot be adopted in a new family until you have denounced the old what? That is adoption. So in baptism, you act it out. I die to that family, which has all these curses, which have been claiming me, so they bury you. Demons think you have been buried. They jump to another member of the family. For you, you resurrect in another family of believers. So that's the purpose of baptism. For you to start a new life in another kingdom, which is called the church. So in other words, legally, to break that yoke. Have you ever been water baptized? Yes. So the curses are broken on me, but what I'm saying is I see them in my children. Yeah. You're, okay, they are broken in you. You see them in your children. Every, the things of the spirit 
everybody receives them by themselves. So Abraham follows God and walks with God and gets all the blessing because he dissociated himself from terror and his family. Get out of your family, get out of your clan so that I will bless you. When Isaac comes, God asks Isaac, do you want the covenant I made with Abraham, your father? Isaac said, yes. So he blesses him because he has entered the covenant. When Jacob came, God asked Jacob, do you want the covenant I made with Abraham, with Isaac? Do you want me to confirm it with you? Jacob said, yes. So every generation has a responsibility to either choose the other line or the line that you chose. Your children have a part in it. There's a, to a certain degree, they can get some of your blessing, like Jacob, like Isaac, but at a certain moment for them to go to the full manifestation of those blessings, they had to embrace the covenant themselves. So when Jacob died, he had 12 children, they became a big nation. So God comes to this generation of Moses at Mount Sinai. He says, do you want the covenant? It is because of that covenant that I came for you in Egypt and took you out. But do you want the covenant? The generation of Moses said yes. So God confirmed the covenant with them. Every generation can either choose to walk in the ways of their ancestors, which are evil, or they denounce them and walk with the Lord. Yeah. We are done.